I'm Josh Bakey with journalingcontractor.org, and I'm at the 2019 IADC Well Control Conference in Galveston, Texas. Joining me is Marcus Mason, CEO of Smith Mason & Company. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. During your presentation today, you focused a lot on the future of well control training. What are some of the challenges you face as a well control training provider? You know, the challenges we face are, are, are not unique. Uh, fortunately, as a third-party training provider, we operate classes across the spectrum. Uh, we, have, we have classes from any given classroom could have six clients in there, right? So we have to make sure that we perform a message that can uh, not only meet a minimum standard, but engage students enough to where they understand the challenges that they're facing, and they can turn around and reapply those challenges back to their rig and their challenges. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to see it in the dynamics of the different basins and, you know, the, the our area challenges that people face. Everyone wants specific training but you have to give a course that meets a minimum standard but also increases the level of knowledge at the same time. What do you see as some of the key focus of your training partner model? Right, so you know, the first factor in the training partner model is understanding what our clients want. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're a service company to the industry and we have to make sure that we have the conversations up front to address not only the challenges, but the wants and needs of the students. So that's kind of the first model. The second part of it is comprehensive well control training. Um, we pride ourselves in making sure that every instructor we put in the classroom is not only, uh, not only has practical field experience, but also has the understanding of how to accurately deliver a message in a quality environment. They have to be able to address changes in a classroom. They have to be able to address understanding adult learning theory. They have to be able to address learning, learning disabilities or disadvantages that students Students might have in a classroom and then the final part that comes with the training partner model is the follow-up and it's probably the most critical part that a lot of companies understand want and need but either don't have the time budget or ability to follow up with how a training program went or don't have the ability to go out and say you know what did you like what was the most the biggest advantage for you a lot of organizations have built-in uh, auditors and built-in uh, people that'll go out throughout the field and ask the questions of their field to help improve their training but that's a big expense and not only from the, the the traveling aspect but from the time the day rates all the things that are associated with it so we put that in a way that clients can move the, the burden onto us as a training provider. We can help them follow up with that. We can go out and ask the questions after the fact to say, where did we succeed as your training, provi training pro provider? And then where in turn did your field operations like what they got and put it back in the classroom? So we're able to switch the model around. We're seeing a lot more companies today utilizing interactive learning. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the advantages to this learning method? And also, how can companies uh, better analyze the success of this uh, learning method? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and look, you, you look from everything from what your children do on a daily basis in a classroom to what you do as a daily basis as a hobby. You know, why is that more fun to do something that you really enjoy? Because it's interactive, it's engaging, it's something you're passionate about. So we try to take the, the classroom environment and turn that into a learning environment where people are enjoying the concepts. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the term death by PowerPoint's used a lot. Uh, in, in any class that still just focuses on beating people over the head with PowerPoint is going to just evolve out of the industry. It's not gonna be able to keep up with today's changing standards and the changing challenges that people address today. Now, one of the ways we're able to help measure the impactfulness of that is direct client feedback. That's number one. And then the other side of it is we try to engage with clients in a, in a way to where we can measure non-direct metrics. Uh, things like turnover and retention, where those aren't always directly attributed to training success or failure. It's, an, it's a component. It's an, a component of when people leave the classroom, they feel more comfortable in the role they have to perform because they've been able to practice. You know, uh, one particular exercise we like to use is critical conversations. So we're giving students a chance to have a critical conversation in a non-critical situation. Mm. They get to practice it. And you know, you, you get these, our industry is male dominant, right? And, and you have people in the classroom that don't wanna have that conversation because they don't know how, they've never been trained. So if you can give them those little aspects that help make their job easier, or give them those little aspects that give them the practice they need to have a conversation, it's, it's practice. You know, they're, they're getting used to it and they're, they're getting a little more comfortable in their role and their skin. What is a dynamic risk assessment and how can the industry better incorporate that into their training programs? Sure, and, and to be fair, anyone that works for me is going to know that I butchered the explanation of this, but the way that I break it down into terms that I can understand of what a dynamic risk assessment is, is, is it keeps us between the ditches, right? We, we give the student the ability to understand that if they can stay on the road, 
they're safe. If they can make a decision that keeps them on the path, they're okay. Uh, once you start veering off the road, so to speak, who within your organization are you notifying of the additional challenges or who within your organization are you making aware that this is not a safe environment and I need to, I need to change or I need to do something a little different in the situation. Uh, and once again, it's something that my, my team would be upset with me butchering the explanation of, but that's the best way I can describe it. And, you know, the other aspect of dynamic risk assessment is how you, how you apply it in the classroom. Um, you know, from everything from simulation to test taking to question and answer sessions, you have to think through the process of, you know, where can I, where can things go wrong? Where can I, where, where in this particular event can this action or non-action hurt me or hurt someone else or cause a situation in a well control event to go wrong. So we're able to use a dynamic risk assessment through almost every aspect of it from you know the, the introductions to the classroom engagement through simulations and even when you finally get down to the test taking aspect of it. It's just it, it once again it's it's another tool in a toolbox that a student's able to use in a way to where they feel comfortable to know that they have parameters and that, you know one one wrong answer is not always going to throw you all the way off the course but you know, maybe you can start steering yourself back onto the right path at the end of the day. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Marcus. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. And thank you for watching us on drillingcontractor.org. Mm -hmm.